Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank, thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to, to speak here. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, a bit about my background. I'm, I'm based at the Institut Jean-Nico, which is inter-establishment uh, unit on uh, philosophy of mind and cognitive science. Uh, so in between Ecole Normale Supérieure, Ecole de Sciences Études en Sciences Sociales and uh, CNRS. And I'm also based at the Institute of Behavioral Neuroscience of University College London. So in both places, I'm a bit of a philosopher in a department of cognitive science and a philosopher in a department of uh, neuroscience or an institute of neuroscience. Um, um, and that, that I, I mean, gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of work I do, which is interdisciplinary philosophical work about human cognition. And today I will be presenting entropy prediction and the cultural ecosystem of human cognition. Uh, a challenge to the integration of distributed cognition and predictive processing. So distributed cognition and predictive processing are two overarching frameworks in cognitive science. And I will look at the potential integration of the two and some challenges to, to that integration. So uh, distributed cognition is, um, I mean, at its heart is the idea that all instances of cognition can be understood as emerging from processes distributed at many spatial and temporal scales. And the kind of landmark uh, book or, or a work is uh, Edwin Hutchins' 1995 uh, paper, Cognition in the Wild. And what's interesting about this is that if you look at cognitive processes being distributed, across many spatial and temporal scales, uh, you start to see that um, any system in which cognition emerges out of the interaction of its elements can be studied through this lens. And this goes from the interaction of different neurons to the interaction of areas of the brain and organs of the body. And on a larger scale from an individual's use of cognitive artifacts. So things like a calculator, a compass, our phones, a notebook, uh, to multi-agent cultural practices that unfold in vast cognitive ecosystems. So you start getting things like group cognition and cultural practices unfolding in cognitive ecosystems. Uh, thus, distributed cognition is compatible with the idea that cognition is embodied and active and extended. So in a way, it's, it's very much compatible, even though it precedes a lot of the work on 4E cognition, it's compatible with this. Um, not really new anymore, but it's more recent um, um, trends in cognitive science, right? And there's another relatively newer um, framework in cognitive science called predictive processing. And I'll be looking at the potential complementarity or potential integration of distributed cognition and predictive processing. So predictive processing is a theoretical framework that conceives the brain as fundamentally a prediction engine, right? The idea is that the fundamental activity of the brain is prediction and the updating of those predictions based on error. I'll get into more detail later. And Edwin Hutchins hypothesizes that cultural practices tend to reduce entropy, that is to increase predictability. And given that one of the main units of a study in distributed cognition are cultural practices, uh, the idea is that one can combine the two views the brain as a prediction machine and cultural practices as ways to increase predictability, which holds the promise of a grand unifying scheme of cognition that holds explanatory power across multiple temporal and spatial scales. So that's something um, advanced by Hutchins in 2014 and also uh, defended by Andy Clark in 2016. Uh, so there's a bit of a back and forth between the two authors and Andy Clark, uh, he's a proponent of uh, predictive processing. And um, here I will be looking at what I call the problem of entropic cultural practices. So the idea is that some cultural practices ranging from playing piñata to civil disobedience, um, from free parting to Cartesian doubt, actually tend and intend to increase entropy, that is to decrease predictability. So they are doing the opposite of uh, Edwin Hutchins' conjecture. And this, I will argue, poses a problem both for predictive processing and for distributed cognition, and by extension to the integration of the two frameworks. So this is how the presentation will go. Um, 
this intro that you just saw, and then I'm going to move into looking at distributed cognition more in detail. Then I'll look at predictive processing more in detail, and then I will outline the problem of entropic cultural practices. I will then offer a way out of the problem of entropic cultural practices and wrap the whole thing up, you know, time dependent with a conclusion and future directions. So distributed cognition. Uh, the, um, the framework of distributed cognition is based on Edwin Hutchins' original fieldwork aboard the USS Palau, which is a Navy uh, ship. So he was originally an ethnographer uh, turned cognitive scientist, and he was looking at how the complex computational problems uh, that the USS Palau had to face and the people in the USS Palau had to face uh, mostly relating to navigation and to the use of resources, how these problems were tackled, right? And he found that these uh, computational challenges were solved through a cognitive process that was widely distributed across a team of navigators and their cognitive artifacts. So there was no really a representation that was internal to one person and then a series of transformations of that representation through computation. Instead, the process was distributed beyond the individual. Um, the insights from this fieldwork resulted in a theoretical framework that sees all instances of cognition and emerging from, as emerging from distributed processes. And this has been used also in aviation, sports, healthcare, informatics, search and rescue operations, or management, to name but a few recent examples. These are all examples uh, from the last five, six years. Uh, so it gives you an idea that it's not only a theoretical pursuit, but it's, it's actively applied in cognitive science, ethnography, anthropology, psychology. It's been a very, very influential framework and one that has been successfully implementing to understand a lot of uh, different cultural practices. Um, and again, cultural practices are very central to distributed cognition, right? This is the way that Hutchins uh, describes cultural practices. Cultural practices are the things people do and their ways of being in the world. A practice is cultural if it exists in a cognitive ecology such that it is constrained by or coordinated with the practices of other persons. Above all else, cultural practices are the things people do in interaction with one another. Cultural practices include particular ways of seeing the world. Cultural practices are not cultural models traditionally construed as disembodied mental representations of knowledge. Rather, they are fully embodied skills. Cultural practices organize the action in situated actions. They are emerging products of dynamic distributed networks of constraints. So the idea is there are some constraints and cultural practices emerge uh, to solve these uh, computational problems. And there are also ways in which people experience and interact uh, with the world is based on these cultural practices. Right, a very good example to, to see what this is, is queuing. Uh, I decided that uh, given this, the, UK-based uh, talk uh, to, to bring a very UK example. So this is the cultural practice of queuing. Uh, and this is an example from a concert by Ed Sheeran somewhere in the UK, where, you know, the queuing was kind of scaffolded, as you can see on the left, by fences. And then absolutely with no pre-design, a queue that is exactly like the one on the, on the left emerged uh, naturally, like through self-organization. So people started to arrive and they intuitively started to form a queue outside of the fence. And it's just such a nice uh, pattern. Um, so the idea is that once you've been enculturated in a culture in which people tend to queue, um, you understand, you are able to, to take part in this cultural practice. And what this cultural practice is doing is solve a very complicated problem right, the problem of order of arrival and who is next in line, which if you just had a group of people, uh, all of these people say like a thousand people arriving at different times and somebody had to keep track of all of those orders that would require a lot of computational car uh, power because there are many dimensions. You, you'll have like uh, too many dimensions. And here what you do in this example is a dimensionality reduction, right? You take something that's a, rep a computational problem or an abstract uh, thing like order of arrival and you make order of arrival coincide with place in line. So you reduce um, the place of people in a space from three dimensions to two dimensions 
and by cons uh, constraining uh, people's plays, um, you solve uh, by extension the computational problem. Uh, so here people not only are able to take part in the queue, they're able to, once they've been enculturated, this affects the way they perceive things. So they will perceive this as a queue. And again, a queue here is a very much a group axiom and one that's very deeply emb embedded and embodied. Um, and the idea is uh, that, that Hutchins defends in 2010. Uh, so this is a bit before predictive processing comes into the fore, right? Like one year before, um, or maybe, maybe it's at the same time as the very first Carl Friston paper, but, but they're kind of independently um, Hutchins uh, defends the idea that cultural practices tend to decrease entropy. And this is based in a lot of his fieldwork and a lot of the study of cultural practices. And he provides a comprehensive inventory of the ways in which cultural practice achieve this uh, entropy reduction. Uh, dimensionality reduction, the production of a conceptual structure of, out of complex assemblages of possibly preconceptual material via the conjunction of features. So here in what we just saw is the conjunction of position in the line with order of arrival. Um, this means that things are more predictable. Uh, in, an, in other ways, it's the entropy is reduced. And it's more predictable because if you just arrive in the queue, you are able to, arrive, to predict who is next in line, who is before you, who is the second in line, who is the third in line. And also after you've been in the queue for a while, how long it will take you to get to the, to the front of the queue. So there is a whole host of predictions that could have been impossible without the cultural practices that become possible because of this reduction of entropy through dimensionality reduction. Another example is filtering, which is preserving some features or elements while ignoring others. So some kind of selective attention in a way. So an example is directing our attention to the white lines painted at the edge of a mountain road to be able to drive. Um, Another one is constraint satisfaction, the simultaneous fulfillment of multiple restrictions that change the probability of different configurations of cultural practices emerging. So when cycling, there is a simultaneous fulfillment of the constraints of the human body, the mechanics of the bike, and a rich legal and cultural code, which makes certain ways of cycling more likely to emerge. There's not so many ways in which you can cycle because you're kind of constrained by the anatomy of the human body and the mechanics of the bike itself that are kind of designed, uh, the, the bike is designed for the human body. So there's really one way to use it. And there's also this kind of cultural or cognitive ecosystem also uh, playing a role here. And th there is many more cases and you can, you can visit the Hutchins paper. Um, but the idea is more recently, uh, this is a Hutchins code, I have been using information theoretic measures to explore the hypothesis that cultural practices tend to reduce entropy at all scales in a cultural cognitive ecosystem. This is important because a brain that is a prediction machine, as suggested by Clark in his lecture's work, will require predictable experience. So here Hutchins is making the explicit proposal and that part of the interest in thinking about uh, cultural practices reducing entropy is that it makes distributed cognition and predictive processing compatible. And let's look now at what predictive processing is and then look at the potential uh, integration of the two. Um, and here I will follow an action-oriented version of predictive processing according to which the same process called active inference uh, based on Carl Friston's work subsumes perception, cognition and action. And for a detailed introduction to predictive processing, you can look at the books by Howey and by Clark. And for recent review of some philosophical issues surrounding predictive processing, there is a very good article by Howey. Um, and here I'll give a sketch. I'm, I'm not going to defend predictive processing, just outline a very kind of rough bones, a rough skeleton of predictive processing. So the idea is the brain is a hierarchical prediction mechanism. Right? And such a mechanism is constantly predicting incoming sensory input. And what we mean by a hierarchy is that the higher the echelon in the hierarchy, the wider the spatiotemporal range of those predictions. So very low on the hierarchy, it will be predicting something like what could be one point in a space in the next millisecond or fraction of millisecond. And higher up, you will be making predictions about faces. And higher up, you will be making predictions about uh, general situations, overall situations. 
and maybe like future events that might might be happening. So kind of like higher range anticipation, not only in a space, but also in, in time. And the idea is that predictions cascade down the hierarchy and go sideways along a given level. Uh, so that predictions from, from higher levels will influence the predictions on lower levels and eventually determine predictions of sensory, incoming sensory input. And this, the mismatch between predictions and sensory input, which is called prediction error, will go up the hierarchy. Uh, so if, if, the, the, if the prediction gets something wrong, like it thinks that a particular point is gonna be a certain shade of red and it's a different shade of blue, uh, that error will go up the, the prediction uh, hierarchy until new updated predictions can account for said error. So there will be a constant back and forth of um, prediction and prediction updating. Um, and this process is then weighted or modulated by how important and reliable errors are expected to be, uh, which is estimated through precision, which is uh, the inverse of variance, statistically speaking. Um, in this case, actually estimated through expected precision of those errors. And predictions with lower assigned precision will be less likely to drive further processing up the hierarchy. So in a very, it's a bit of a comic book example, but imagine you have one eye that sees much worse than the other eye. And there is like one of the eyes is detecting error and the, the bad eye is detecting error and the good eye is not detecting error. So precision will kind of modulate it so that this error is kind of pushed down and will not play a very big role in updating predictions. And that's a very basic way of, of, of putting it. But here you, you can see uh, from Haishal and uh, 2018, uh, you, you can see a kind of a sketch of how this will work. Uh, so it will be something like mental states at the very abstract level will predict the activity of lower levels in the hierarchy, right? All the way to motor output, uh, and to sensory input, right? To predictions of sensory, sensory input. And there will be error coming up uh, at lower levels, the prediction error. And what happens is that this uh, expected precision will be kind of making a gate, uh, a gating uh, process to see how far up the hierarchy predictions go. And then predictions will be kind of changing all the time to account for prediction error and they'll keep on uh, going down the hierarchy. Um, it's not uh, very, very important that you get the, 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 the details of this, just the idea that uh, prediction is very central, uh, I think is, is, is good enough uh, if, you've never, if you've never heard about this framework. So the idea is that the overarching goal of the organism is prediction error minimization over time, which the organism achieves both by updating its predictions and by changing the world through action to fulfill predictions. Um, and it is that action occurs to fulfill these predictions in order to minimize prediction error. So again, something like the, the way action happens is uh, the, there will be a prediction uh, of a future proprioceptive state of a future position of the body, and then the body will move to fulfill those predictions. And again, by biasing the degree to which error units drive further processing, precision modulates not just perceptual predictions, but also action-related predictions, transforming the likelihood of different actions. So precision weighting both uh, changes the likelihood of predictions about sensory input and also uh, predictions about motor output. Uh, so, so precision is playing a very important role. Different patterns of precision weighting will result in different perceptions and different actions. Um, here's about the potential integration of predictive processing and distributed cognition coming from the predictive processing camp. Um, again, discussing the idea of cultural ecosystems and uh, cultural practices. And the Clark says, within such ecosystems, a slowly evolved culturally transmitted practices sculpt the very world within which neural prediction error minimization occurs. Those cultural practices may themselves be usefully understood, Hutchins conjectures as entropy, surprise, minimization devices operating at extended spatial and temporal scales. Action and perception then work together to reduce prediction error only against the more slowly evolving backdrop of a culturally distributed process that spawns a succession of practices and, desi as des and designer environments. 
So here you get people from the predictive processing camp and from the distributed cognition camp making the claim that the two frameworks are um, complementary and very easily integrated because the brain is a prediction machine and cultural practices uh, tend to increase prediction uh, the, the, or decrease entropy. So now if Clark's idea above is on track, the mechanisms through which cultural practices increase predictability are then also mechanisms through which our predictive mechanisms minimize prediction error. They're kind of two sides of the same coin, as it were. And very interesting work here is Kirchhoff and Kirfestein uh, offer an idea of how this will work. So the constraints that come from cultural practices, which is very much discussed in Hutchins, uh, influence how precision is weighted in a given context and thus how uncertainty is kept to a minimum. So the idea is that by being enculturated uh, in a particular cultural cognitive ecosystem or in a particular society, uh, we learn certain patterns of precision weighting. And then these patterns of precision weighting um, serve to, to keep uncertainty to a minimum, to, to uh, increase predictability. Here is a very good example if we look again at the filtering example of a road, right? Uh, we're trying to drive on a mountain road and it's quite difficult because it's very quickly changing sensory input, obviously that the road is, is changing quite fast. And take filtering as a case in point. We're driving our car through a mountain road, it is dark and perceiving the edge of the road is difficult. Uh, thankfully, roads are designer environments. So if we have been properly enculturated, high precision will be assigned to the white lines that signal where the edge is. So our predictive system will be paying a special attention to, to the white lines. And these are the lines that will kind of be driving uh, future predictions. Predictions will then quickly adapt to the related error so as not to drive over the edge of the road and uncertainty will be kept to a minimum. Um, and here's what uh, I say might be a problem for, so, so far, so far, this picture is, is, is quite nice. There's like a very good story of how the two fit together and there were kind of inter independent conjectures or independent uh, frameworks that seem really well fitted to each other uh, based on the idea of predictability. But there's a problem, I think, in that there are some practices, as I mentioned early, earlier, that actually increase entropy. So uh, some cultural practices tend to increase entropy. Let us call this latter type entropic cultural practices as opposed to the standard negentropic cultural practices. So negentropic just means that they decrease entropy, they tend to decrease entropy. And let us call the challenging question the problem of entropic cultural practices. I mean, ultimately distinguishing between entropic and negentropic cultural practices requires information theoretic measurements of, of entropy, basically. But prima facie, entropic cultural practices include many instances of games, comedy, and art. So, and a lot of experiments here, uh, and a lot of anthropological or ethnographic work. But basically, going to a stand-up show involves laughing about unexpected punchlines. So, surprise, actually, it's a very important part of uh, comedy. Uh, same in music. Listening to music involves navigating unexpected musical patterns. And unpredictability might also be a key ingredient in creative activities in general. It's something very important for both the experience of art, but also the creation of art. And a, a very good example is the situation is international. So there's a group of uh, artists and researchers in, in Paris in the 50s and 60s who were trying to propose who are trying to, on purpose, uh, get lost in the city, to try to explore the city in different ways. They will also try to take existing cultural material and cut it out and reassemble it. Uh, so, so they were, in a way, very actively trying to increase entropy. And this was a very important aspect of their practice. But it, it's common to many other practices, going from uh, surrealism to, to a lot of current uh, artistic uh, practices. And it, it's not an issue also only in like arts and entertainment. Uh, in the sociopolitical domain, things like strikes, revolts, protests and riots are all forms of entropic cultural practices that are trying to disrupt the established order. And even in academic inquiry, um, the purposeful disruption of order is often a precursor to discovery and insight. So people are very often trying to increase disorder to try to elicit 
a kind of eureka moment of insight or maybe new theories uh, emerging out of the disorder. That's a very good quote that, that I, I like that is from a sociologist. And this is something that the sociologist Mills uh, used to do. So you simply dump out their four disconnected folders, mixing up their contents and then resort them. So he'll just take his folders and throw, throw them in the air and then mix them up. And then you try to do it in a more or less relaxed way to be passively receptive to unforeseen and unplanned linkages. So he will get a lot of different like things that he was working on or he was interested in, he will throw them around randomly uh, to try to create uh, kind of like connections that he wasn't able to perceive before. Um, and of course, the, the problem of entropic cultural practices is not simply that the given practice decreases predictability in some instances, um, because cognitive ecosystems merely increase the probability of certain patterns emerging. Is um, here all of the uh, cultural and cultu all of enculturation can be seen as ways to bias the probability of the dynamic formation of particular practices. So in these dynamic systems, it makes no sense to follow a regularity understanding of causation. The problem of entropic practices comes only when we find some cultural practices that tend to decrease predictability instead of increasing it. So it's not so much about a cultural practice at one point increasing, um, increasing entropy. It's really about practices that overall, once you look at the practice emerging in different contexts, tending to decrease predictability over time. And I, I think this is very much the case with a lot of the practices that I've uh, described above. And to see the extent of the problem of entropic pra cultural practices, it is helpful to look at how it presents a threat, not only to the union of distributed cognition and PP, but also a problem for distributed cognition for PP independently. So for distributed cognition, it is a problem because everything either increases or decreases entropy. So the connection between entropy and cultural practices becomes less meaningful. Once we simply say that some cultural practices decrease entropy and others don't. It's, um, uh, it, it's borderline uh, triviality to say that. And for predictive processing, it raises the following dilemma. Why will an organism that is chiefly trying to reduce prediction error engage in practices that are designed to increase prediction error? It seems that either prediction error minimization uh, does not hold or entropic cultural practices do not exist. And both positions are rather hard to defend. And to try to think of a way out of this problem, it's interesting to, to look at the darkroom problem, which is a problem that predictive processing has faced in the past. So there is a certain resonance between the problem of entropic cultural practices and the darkroom problem, uh, which is that prediction error minimizers, which is us, uh, should find their deepest motivations fulfilled by the most utterly boring experiences, since a sure way to minimize prediction error is just to place oneself in a highly predictable environment, such as a dark room. But obviously this doesn't seem to be what humans need, uh, are trying to do. They very often engage in activities that are designed to increase error, to increase surprise. And what I think is that by exploring existing responses to the dark room scenario, we can start to see possible ways to overcome the problem of entropic cultural practices. And a very good place to start is Clark's uh, case of looking at art and learning. And what he says is that by designing and repeatedly redesigning our own environments, populating them with new books, paintings, theories, games and practices, we humans continually move the goalposts for our own prediction-based learning. So in a way, we, we, by being embedded in a culture, we learn to value, which means assign high precision to certain cultural practices that help us by enabling learning in our goal of reducing prediction error over time. So in our way, we, we give ourselves difficult problems uh, that, that we're gonna struggle with because if we learn to solve those problems, we're gonna then learn to solve other uh, more uh, general problems uh, that that we're gonna that we're gonna be facing. So at the end, we are still minimizing prediction error over time. We are becoming better at predicting by engaging in these uh, cultural practices that are in a way entropic cultural practices. So it seems that to solve the problem of entropic cultural practices, we need to bring our attention to how cognition is widely distributed both spatially and temporally, right? So it's not only in the moment and a momentary increase or decrease in entropy, but an overall increase or decrease in entropy that uh, might, be, might be 
uh, the key here. And educational games are structures designed for the agent to learn new, but already culturally established patterns of precision weighting. And the learning is generally gradual along some learning curve. So one is getting slowly better at prediction error minimization, at reducing entropy, basically. But this does not seem to be the case with the derive uh, that I mentioned, or with some, I haven't mentioned this here, but with some uh, rituals one sees in some cultures that are uh, very much about wandering, or with protests and revolts, or with the throwing around of research folders that I mentioned earlier, that seem very much made to disrupt established order with a very unclear, like there is no learning uh, involved. It's not, it doesn't seem to be a learning practice. The issue with these disruptive entropic cultural practices is that they cannot be easily explained away by appealing to learning. There is no learning, pr uh, learning curve, as it were. There is no straightforward way in which they enable the gradual improvement of prediction success. And there are no established patterns of precision weighting that the agents involved could learn. So the only viable solution, again, is to conjecture that both the learning and the disruptive types of entropic practices increase predictability over time, which is compatible both with prediction error minimization over time and with the claim that all cultural practices increase predictability over time. So in the case of entropic cultural practices, they decrease predictability in the short term and increase it in the long term. And this is certainly what happens in the case of learning. And I will argue it's also what happens with disruptive entropic cultural practices. A range of entropic cultural practices destabilize a theoretical structure in the case of research by coming up with problems that the structure cannot assimilate, which prompts a conceptual reordering. And the idea is this, that if the cultural cognitive ecosystem is seen as a constrained satisfaction system that settles into a subset of possible configurations of elements, then entropic cultural practices are ways of disassembling existing configurations to give rise to alternative ones. So disruptive cultural practices are ways of disrupting existing cognitive processes and existing cultural practices, which is useful when cognitive ecosystems revolve around negentropic cultural practices that increase predictability in globally suboptimal ways. So when there are negentropic practices that are not globally optimal, that are kind of like a stack in maybe a locally optimal point, it's helpful to have these disruptive practices. And there are two ways in which suboptimal practices might result. The first one is path dependency, which is the idea that cultural practices develop in contingent ways, uh, which might lead to practices that are just good enough at a local level, but not optimal at a global level. And this is something that has been shown to be the case in many different cases. You have, you have a, a very good example with language and linguistic practices in Ferreira and Patson 2007. And entropic practices might also, might, that are suboptimal uh, might also emerge in a particular situation in which they reduce entropy efficiently and then persist even when their efficiency has substantially decreased over time. And these suboptimal practices persist because cultural practices are both self-reinforcing and mutually reinforcing. So once you've already learned to queue, if you arrive to a new country and you might try to queue, even though queuing may, might not be the, the thing that's, that's done there. And so you might stubbornly try to keep on queuing if you are British, uh, even though you see that people from this other country keep on skewing the, skipping the queue. Um, but they're also mutually reinforcing. So practices like putting lines on the floor to show where the queue goes or frowning upon other people uh, when they skip the queue. Uh, are practices that are kind of intertwined. All of these cultural practices within a culture and within the cognitive ecosystem are mutually reinforcing. And this gives them a certain stickiness, as it were. It means that they are resistant to change. And that's why it's useful sometimes to get uh, in disruptive practices when, when these suboptimal negentropic practices become kind of outdated. Um, there might be no way of moving to a more efficient negentropic practice without first undergoing a period of decreased efficacy in terms of predictability. The role of disruptive cultural practices is precisely to induce these periods of fruitful disorder. So the conclusion is that paying proper attention to the dynamics of cognitive ecosystems and to how cultural practices operate at different scales, both spatially and temporally, allows us to tackle the problem of entropic cultural practices.
the conjecture that will unite predictive processing and distributed cognition remains. All cultural practices tend to reduce entropy. The necessary caveat caveat, sorry, the necessary caveat is that different practices reduce entropy at different time scales. Neoentropic cultural practices, like the ones in Hutchins' detailed inventory that I mentioned earlier, uh, do so in relatively short temporal scales. Entropic cultural practices, both disruptive practices and learning practices, do so at longer time scales. Together, they contribute to an increase of predictability over time in a cognitive ecosystem. This increase in predictability over time contributes to the prediction error minimization activities of the humans operating within said cognitive ecosystem. Now, I've, as I said, uh, you know, the necessary caveat, caveat is that different practices reduce entropy at different timescales, which sounds a small ca a caveat if, if one says it on, on the go, but it's actually a bigger issue, a bigger challenge than it might seem at first. And this is the reason why. Uh, so Hutchins ethnographic and theoretical work has provided a series of process, processes like dimensionality reduction through which neoentropic cultural practices reduce entropy. We need to find a series of processes through which entropic cultural practices reduce entropy over time. And this is not easy because simply inversing the known processes of neoentropic cultural practices will not do. Increasing dimensionality by itself will increase entropy in the short term, but there is no indication that should lead us to believe that such a process could result in a decrease in entropy over time. And the, the goal here would be to develop a taxonomy of entropic cultural practices, which will require an interdisciplinary effort involving ethnographic fieldwork, information theory, and some empirical work in psychology, neuroscience, cognitive sciences. Um, and a related concern, is that claiming that all cultural practices reduce entropy over time begs the question of what the appropriate time scale is. So take this example. If one considers Averroes criticism of the Ptolemaic system as leading to the Copernican revolution, as I'm back here 2015, as an instance of an entropic practice leading to entropy reduction over time, then what over time means is several centuries which is possible, it's possible that this is the case, that um, I'm not meaning to say that we should not expect vast timescales on some instances. The issue is that some claims about entropy reduction will not be empirically testable, and it, it will be borderline ad hoc at times. Uh, thus, it seems that it is certainly better to refer to the claim that cultural practices reduce entropy over time as a conjecture rather than as a hypothesis. And then from this conjecture, we might be able to generate testable hypotheses. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that this is more of a conjecture rather than a hypothesis. But I think that despite these difficulties, the union of predictive processing and distributed cognition holds incredible potential. It can offer us a vision of different cultural practices unraveling dynamic, dynamically at different spatiotemporal scales to modulate how humans engage with entropy in their effort to minimize prediction error. Some cultural practices ranging from queuing to stargazing will reduce entropy from the get-go. Other practices such as games and educational activities will increase entropy at first so that the individuals involved can gradually progress in their attempt at reducing error. And there will also be practices in which entropy is actively sought for in the hope of prompting radical rearrangements of the existing cultural patterns with a resulting increase in predictability over time. Great. Thank you so much for, for listening. Um, look